This video is aimed at those who consider buying an SF2 rebreather. You have probably come across this scanning the internet for all sorts of information to make an informed decision. Or you have made the decision to already purchase an SF2 and would like to prepare as much as possible while you're waiting for it to arrive. This episode is recorded from an operator's uh, perspective of uh, after roughly 110 units, uh, hours on the unit. And remember that I'm not a dive professional, so please consider this experience offered from peer to peer. Now, most of the things I'm going to cover also apply to other uh, electronic closed circuit rebreathers. Now, why a rebreather in the first place? For me, it was mainly the cost of gases and gas logistics. As I was starting to regularly dive in the 50 meter or 160 foot depth range, I noticed that I started spending serious money on gas mixes. I mean, not only that, but in addition to the standard double twelves on my back, I had to often carry a bottom stage with me. That meant that at depth, my team had to wait for me to switch tanks. I mean, in terms of gas and the compression obligation, every minute that depth counts. And I knew that this issue would become even more pronounced as dives got deeper and longer. Of course, I'm also fascinated by the operating principle of a rebreather, and I like machines. Um, there are additional benefits, such as diving the optimal gas, thereby optimizing the compression, you know, diving moist and warm gas, which in addition to benefiting decompression, simply makes for warmer dives than in open uh, circuit mode. There is, however, a high risk associated to rebreather diving, which I feel must be mentioned. When you are single and in your early 20s and are not fully aware of your personal limitations and talents, this might not be obvious. But as you age and the well-being of your family and maybe even of your employees is at stake, your risk appetite must be in line with the risk profile of diving a rebreather. Uh, mistakes made because your head was still in the office, compounded by the fact that your skills were rusty due to other obligations, can lead to a deadly outcome, even on a shallow recreational dive. This is one of the reasons why I personally don't grasp the concept of a pure recreational rebreather, other than the the commercial aspect of extending the market into an untapped segment. The primary reason I picked the SF2 was that uh, the instructor of my choice, the one who had trained me to become a technical diver, owns a fully certified SF2 service center. A rebreather is a system. It consists of the main unit, but you also have to have access to consumables such as scrubber and occasional replacement of oxygen sensors. And this brings us to the service aspect. Rebreathers even though solidly built, need occasional maintenance and repair. So physical proximity to my instructor and the service center play the role. What I liked about the SF2, in addition to its cool black carbon fiber look, is that it is so streamlined. The, the counter lungs are stowed in a tube in the lower back, which is a reminiscence of the unit's origin as a passive uh, semi-closed rebreather. I'm fully aware of occasional heated online discussions about the difference in work of breathing between shoulder mount account alongs and those on the SF2. But honestly, in almost any diving condition, I did not see the SF2's work of breathing as an issue. Uh, another key strength of the SF2 is that it's a very clean, streamlined unit that lends itself to divers coming particularly from a DIR philosophy. Uh, another key aspect was that there was an active community as of uh, SF2 divers in the German part of Switzerland. While I still mostly dive with my old open circuit bodies, I appreciate the possibility to dive with like-minded people. Now, my personal configuration from day one consisted of two over-the-shoulder manual ads for Oxygen and Dillon. There is simply no way to get around that if you're a technical diver. The, the unit comes with a factory-installed Shearwater Patrol computer, which has become the de facto standard in the industry. It is a dive can version which drives the electronics of the rebreather. Not much later, I added the second Petrel as a backup, which is connected through a simple fissure cable to the sensors. You may not need one in the beginning, but once you're conducting the compression dives, any failure of the primary computer would automatically force you to bail out. This is opposed to being able to manually drive the unit and complete the dive in closed circuit mode. It just provides for another level of safety. Um, I considered for some time to replace the second Petrel with a head-up display. The Shearwater Nerd, which has a built-in computer, was too expensive at the time 
and the simple O2 display alternatives did not provide an additional layer of safety should the primary computer fail. I quickly noticed that for most of my dive profiles, I would have both of my computers in, in, in plain sight. I might change my view on this once I start serious underwater photography or videography. About 20 dives into the activity, I replaced the factory loop with the combination of Cooper hoses and a Golem gear bailout valve. Uh, additional spend, I know, but countless simulated bail bailout drills convinced me actually that it would be good to be able to switch quickly to the onboard dilo and this bailout, which means being off the system and breathing gas open circuit before deploying my offboard bailout stage. <clears throat> Again, I'm aware that at extreme depths, the second stage of the aftermarket BOV might possibly not deliver the required gas volume during a CO2 hit, but in any other emergency situation, it would be a relief. I would say that one should be an accomplished technical diver before starting out on a rebreather. If you're still fighting with your buoyancy and proper trim, shooting surface marker buoys in a high workload situation with your mask off is scaring you, then you should take yourself some more time. Because switching to rebreathers means additional complexity. It means a higher workload configuring for a dive and monitoring the PO2 levels, switching them back and forth during the dive and occasionally checking the well-being of the sensors directly by looking at their millivolt readings. It also means saying bye to buoyancy adjustments with your lung volume. That one is now going into the counter lung and the only thing it does, if at all, is affecting your trim. Now, you suddenly have to manage your loop volume and keeping uh, it at an optimal level, which means additional workload when you are ascending. This is in addition to you managing your wing and your dry suit. Regarding the training organization, there's not much choice. TDI is authorized to teach the SF2 and this was fine for me. They are a respectable organization, although maybe not that strict as the DIR type organizations such as Inner Space Explorers, GUE or UTD. You have to be comfortable with your instructor. As far as I'm concerned, I am pretty old school in that regard. I have to fully trust and respect them, especially at the beginning of the training. My life is in their hands. This requires trust and affords respect. Helmut, my instructor, is a highly experienced, no-nonsense guy who adjusted his pace to my talent level. He boosted my ego more than once after sobering, you know, some might say frustrating mistakes. But he's equally good at putting me in my place should my ego occasionally overtake my skills. You will have to pick your own criteria, but I hope I give you some indicators to, to look at. At the time of recording, I've completed three courses on the SF2. The basic SF2 air dilent course, uh, the air dilent decompression course, and most recently the mixed gas diver course. The first course is a combination of rebreather basics and factory training. It is limited to 80 meters or roughly 60 feet and no decompression diving with air as diluent. Second, the second course still uses air as diluent, but it extends your range by limiting the depth to 45 meters or about 140 feet, this time aligned for decompression diving. This course actually covers about 80% of the practice dive profiles that my dive team and I have done around the lakes of Zurich in the last years. From a diluent perspective, the maximum depth is at the edge of what is advisable from a work of breathing and CO2 retention aspect. Also, this is not why I took up rebreather diving. The third course, therefore SF2 mixed gas diver, extended my limits to 60 meters or about 180 feet and diluent gas is up to 1845. This would allow me to access, again, most of my favorite dive spots which are the wrecks of the Ligurian coast in Italy. I often get asked, is there anything I wish I had known earlier about diving a rebreather or specifically an SF2? Not that I would have changed anything, but here are a few points. Um, there is an additional work in preparing the unit before a dive and cleaning it up after one. Before I used to drop my gear in the car very short notice, my diving days now starts about half an hour earlier. For day trips from home, I assemble my unit at home and calibrate the sensors. In order not to get into a rush, I have to pack the scrubber, and I usually do this the evening before and then store it in an airtight sailing bag. On the dive side, there are still some checks that need to be performed, which includes pre-breathing the unit. So don't let your open circuit dive buddies rush you. After the dive, the unit must be washed and disinfected. 
The washing happens every time with a lot of fresh water. I disinfect about every fourth or fifth dive. There seem to be two factions regarding this online. Those who disinfect every time, and those who brag about growing their little ecosystem inside their counter rooms. If you thought you would carry less weight, that might be true for the main unit, but you will go from one to several stages as your courses progress. Remember that you are carrying your bailout with you in the hope of never having to use it. At the beginning, I used to replace the scrubber uh, after each dive, regardless of length and depth. This has changed now. On normal dives to depths of less than 50 meters or 150 feet, and normal workloads, I replace the scrubber about uh, every three hours. This usually means three moderate dives or two series decompression dives. And if you're the explorer type, it will of course mean only one dive. Or the softener lime in 20 kilo kegs. You will go through the small 4.5 kilogram ones in no time. Another reality check is with the oxygen sensor. Treat them well. I remove the head as soon as I can after each dive and dry it with a soft non-lint cloth. Sensors hate humidity. They also hate pressure and they hate high oxygen concentrations. So expose them to these enemies as little as possible. And still they might act up on you. On my first dive trip to Italy, one of the sensors acted up after less than a year. Uh, 45 meters on top of a wreck. Back to shore, it acted as if nothing had happened. The web is full of these stories. Just make sure that you have one or better two spare sensors with you on a multi-day dive trip. I will finish this episode with the cost of ownership. You know, I mean, you guessed it. Owning a rebreather is not cheap. Yes, you save money with gases, but if that was your only reason to buy a rebreather, then mm. if you can barely afford to buy the unit itself, then you are setting yourself up for frustration and even an added risk, because you should never cut corners on scrubber, sensors, maintenance and the like. I hope this episode was useful to you. Please subscribe and leave a comment in the section below.